1 Thessalonians 4, and I, of course, read verse 13 through 18, but we're going to look all the way till 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, and we want to talk about what we look forward to as Christians, specifically the hope of Christ in what we look forward to. And if just think in your mind, you don't have to turn anywhere in the Bible, think in your mind all the places in the Bible where, where God tells His people to look back, where He tells them to remember. If you think of all the times where God has told His people to think back and remember, it's always about His work, right? So, so when they crossed the uh, Jordan River, uh, God told the Israelites to gather up 12 smooth stones and, and stack them up, and so that way when kids would later walk by the pile of rocks, they would say, well, Dad, what's the rocks for? They would say, oh, remember, that's when God delivered us from the Egyptians. And Passover's the same thing. It was, it was God telling his people to look back at the work of God, not the work of Israel, not the work of Jacob or Joseph or anybody else. It's look back, and God delivered you from death by God's own hand. Look back and remember what God has done. And we celebrate uh, communion nowadays, and it's the same thing. When we think back, and specifically, God says, remember. Don't remember what we did. Don't remember anything that we have to offer God or any act of obedience or disobedience, shame, guilt, or pride. He says, look back and remember what God has done. So anytime God is asking us to look back and remember, he's always asking us to look back and remember what he has done. He has, he has caused us to be a people of memorial, but not remembering our own stuff, but remembering what he has done, uh, remembering his accomplishments uh, throughout history. And why does he do that? Why does God tell us to look back and remember what he has done? It's specifically so we will look forward to what he is going to do, and we will trust that he can do what he promises we will do. Now, this, during the New Year's, we spend the whole time uh, looking back over the last year. Uh, you know, this time of year, we get the top 10 uh, movies get uh, announced, whatever the best movies of the year were, the most embarrassing political moments of the year. We reflect on the, on the, the year that was before, and we think, well, we'd like the next year to be more of the same, or we think we'd like the next year uh, to be much better uh, than it was last year. We, we, we think a lot of different things. We look back on last year, hoping for something this coming year, what I'd like us to do, especially this morning, is think about what our hope in Christ means for this coming year, and not even just this coming year, but the rest of our life. Because the Apostle Paul here in 1 Thessalonians 4 centers the heart of the people of Thessalonica on the gospel of Jesus Christ as their hope for the future. So my, my topic this morning, or my uh, title, if you want a title, is the hope of Christ. The hope of Christ. In verses 13 through 18, I want us to understand the hope of Christ is our encouragement. And let's look at a couple of things that the Apostle Paul says here in 1 Thessalonians 4. And if you think I can't talk very well, you go home and try and say that, all right? Okay, you go home and try and say 1 Thessalonians 4 five times fast. All right, brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fell asleep or to grieve like the rest of men. Paul does not want the, the Thessalonians to be ill-informed about people who have died before them. He wants them to have the right information about people who have died. And he wants them to be well-informed about the truth of what happens to Christians when they die. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant, and I don't want you to, to grieve the way people of the world grieve. He wants us to understand when Christians die... They uh, don't go into Never Never Land. They don't go into some vacuum of space where uh, we have lost track of all time or whatever. It, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And there was some concern in the Christian church because there was such an anticipation for the return of Christ that if you died before Christ returned, that you may miss the return of Christ. And Paul wants them to be properly informed. He says, no. When you die, you're present with the Lord. I don't want you to be ignorant and grieve like the world does. Paul wants their encouragement and their hope in Christ to be, to be based on good information. Don't be ignorant about what happens. Be well informed. Unlike many religions or many faiths, understanding uh, the encouragement we have in Christ is not a wish on a star type encouragement. Paul says, be encouraged. People who have died before us are with Christ. They are not just lost. They are not going to miss out on the blessings of being in Christ simply because they died before Christ came. He says, be encouraged. 
this isn't just simply wish on a star. So a wish on a star kind of encouragement is this. Your, your son has a, has a puppy dog, and that puppy dies. And so you say, don't worry. Uh, the puppy uh, went to heaven, and I'm going to buy you a unicorn. Okay, so he's encouraged, right? I mean, okay, the puppy's in heaven. We have no information to know that's true or not. Easy. <laughs> and also, I'm going to buy him a unicorn. So I've given him no actual information. I've just fed him a bunch of stuff I've made up to try and make him feel better. Don't worry about it. I'll get you a unicorn when you're older. That's not what the Apostle Paul is doing here. He says, I want you to be well informed. I don't want you to be ignorant. To be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. Do not be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep. And he's going to base this on reality. And he says, I don't want you to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. So you have two options here. We can be well informed and understand the work of God and what he's doing in the life of Christians. And we can have hope because we're well informed. Or we can be like the rest of the world who has no hope. There is no hope. And, I, and to me, the best example of this, of course, now his life is going to escape. His, his name escapes me. I should have written it down. Uh, the novelist, he wrote uh, Old Man in the Sea. If you hear, think of it, yell it out. Hemingway. Hemingway. Why is that? Okay. But see, this was somebody who, who really did. He, he embodied his entire life, embodied the idea that all we have is now. All we have is now. Hemingway was a secular humanist, an existentialist. He believed that humans were simply carbon matter that happened to be formed in such a way that we had uh, biological function. And so all he had was his life, and he lived it to the fullest. If you know anything about Hemingway's life, he was well-traveled. If it moved and breathed, he hunted it. Uh, and he lived his life full speed because he felt he had to squeeze every bit of adventure out of this life, knowing that ultimately there was nothing after there is no hope in that. That's an exciting life for a short period of time, but there is no hope in that. And Hemingway's death is testament to that. He took his own life with a shotgun. There is no hope in just simply this world in its own. There's no hope in, in how this world is set up. The hope we have has to go beyond, has to go beyond of what is in this world. And that's exactly where the Apostle Paul anchors the hope of the believers in Thessalonica. It's a well-informed hope that is different than this world's hope. It's different than this world's hope that just simply says, well, maybe next week will be better or next year will be better. His hope that he wants these believers to understand is vastly different. So the hope of Christ is our encouragement. In verse 14, we need to understand the hope of Christ is based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Read with me, along with me, verse 14, it says this, we believe that Jesus died and rose again and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. This is his basis of understanding his future hope. The basis of, of Paul's future hope is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and the, the work of Jesus Christ walking out of a tomb. So this is, this is really critical for us to understand. For a lot of us, the gospel of Jesus Christ is sort of a churchy thing, and, and it's important to understand how you know, we need to be forgiven of our sin. But for the Apostle Paul, having hope on a day-to-day -day basis and having hope on a long-term basis on a life that is hard is rooted in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's, it is anchored to it. That's, that's where all his hope is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in fact, he says this, If Jesus is not raised... We are the dumbest people who ever lived. The, most to, the, the people most to be pitied in the whole world is Christians if Jesus is still dead. And, and this is where the hope of Paul is. It's, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus rose, we will rise again. Listen, I'll, let me just be honest with you. Coming to church is a real waste of time if you don't believe dead people raised from the dead. If you believe Jesus is still dead... Or if you think dead people don't, won't be raised one day, then Sunday would be a great day to sleep in. Because there's no hope without it. Without the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and without Jesus having the power through God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit to be raised from the dead, there is no hope. The entire hope that the Bible proclaims to us, the hope that the Apostle Paul is proclaiming for us in the future is based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Christians die, Jesus is still coming. It's what he says here. He says, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that, that God will raise those who died before us. Jesus changed fundamentally for the rest of time how death works. Um, do we understand, you got to understand this. When Jesus rose from the dead, he changed all the rules on how death works. See, before Jesus is raised from the dead, there's no victory over death. And when you're dead, you're dead. But now that Jesus is raised from the dead, in him we experience eternal life. So when we die, it's just simply moving from here to there. Death now for us is not so much death, it's moving from this place to the place where we are with Christ. To think of death in the same terms after the resurrection of Jesus Christ is to miss the point of the Bible completely. Jesus, in raising from the dead, changes the rules on death. He now says that death is really just going from here to there. And that's exactly what happens with people who die before Christ comes. He's saying, we're here, we're in our bodies, we're doing that. And then, you know, whatever happens, car accident, heart attack, whatever. Now we move from this body to hanging out with Jesus. That doesn't sound so bad. Actually, the Bible makes it sound pretty good. It, it, it's going from suffering and, and pain and difficulty to life and eternity with Christ. And it's a good thing. Now, for those of us who must wait, who God is, uh, has not yet taken us home, it is painful because we experience loss and we suffer and we miss loved ones. We wouldn't minimize that in the, in the least. But to, but to understand death in the same way the world understands death is to completely misunderstand what Jesus did on the cross. If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, we have no hope. And if he is raised from the dead, we should see the passing of saints and our own passing completely differently. We know that there will be a day, a day will come when Jesus will return, and all those who have died before will be raised. And all of us who are living here will experience that resurrection even before death, and that'll be pretty cool. Whenever you, just so you know, whenever you think about doing a passage uh, in terms of a message from a um, passage like 1 Thessalonians 4, you sort of hope that halfway through the greatest illustration of all time will happen and the rapture will occur or something. Because then it like proves you're right, but you know, I don't know. We'll just see what happens. I'm just going to keep talking till it does. <laughs> now, you've, now you really have lost hope. Okay. <laughs> so when Christians die, we understand Jesus is still coming. Jesus changed how death works for those who are in him. Jesus now is in command, in charge of who is alive. Jesus has complete authority over death. Jesus determines the relationship of us with death. And in fact, now in Christ, when we put our faith in him, death has no victory over us. Death is not a concern for us. Death is not a worry for us. That's the truth about dying for Christians. The question is, uh, how, we, how we relate to the death of saints reveals our understanding of the resurrection of Christ. It reveals uh, it, re it reveals where we're resting. Uh, when, when, when we're struggling with this idea of resurrection, death is hard to handle. When, when we understand completely the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can more confidently um, be assured as we, as we see loved ones go. This is the way I put it when, when I sometimes talk with folks is, is this, is that I actually think Christians can grieve better. We can grieve more deeply. We can mourn more deeply. We can, we can experience sorrow on a deeper level because we have a, a hope that undergirds our sorrow. See, we can, as Christians, we can more, if I can say it this way, I'm going to anyway, whether I can or not. <laughs> we can more comprehensively explore the depth of our sorrow because our sorrow does not involve despair. When there is despair at the end of your sorrow, at some point you want to catch yourself and say, no, I, you know, I just have to get over this. But if at the end of the day you know there is hope in Christ, you can fully explore the depth of your sorrow because at the end of the day you have hope. So that's why I say Christians, we can actually grieve deeper. We can mourn a loss in a more heartfelt way because we ultimately have a hope that under, undergirds our, dis, our, our grief, undergirds our mourning. I, I don't like it when Christians try and convince us that as Christians we shouldn't be sad 
when Christians die. I th actually think, honestly, I think Christians should be more sad or sadder. One of those two. Christians should understand at a deeper level how death represents how badly sin has ruined what God made. We should experience the suffering and loss of knowing loved ones are separated. We should experience the sorrow of knowing that what God made perfect, we ruined. And I think we should mourn and we should be sad, but there is a hope and a joy that comes with knowing Christ that there will be a day when our joy will be made full and we will be reunited with loved ones as well as with our Christ. That is the truth about dying. Christians die, Jesus is risen from the dead, and we look forward to a day when we will be raised with him. Jesus changed how death works, and if, if we're going to rest in Christ, we must have our minds adjusted in knowing how death works. Death is not permanent. It is simply moving from here to there, so to speak. So we have hope that is in Christ. It is our encouragement. We have a hope that is in Christ that is well-informed. Based on good information, we're not talking about unicorns and puppies here. We're talking about the, the truth of God declared to us about the work of Jesus and how he overcame death. Now let's look at verses uh, 15, 16, and 17 of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. It, I'm going to read it again, verse 15. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still, are still alive who are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. <clears throat> Excuse me, verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet, and excuse me, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. The hope of Christ is our, is our encouragement. The hope of Christ is our encouragement, and this is to be compared with the world who seeks escape. The hope of Christ, the hope of Christ over death, ought to encourage our hearts, ought to encourage our minds. In fact, she says in verse 18, therefore, encourage each other, with these words. Provide each other with good information about how Jesus has overcome death on the cross, how Jesus has overcome sin, and encourage each other with these words when you get worried about what the next life holds or whether there is any hope in this life or when we sorrow over the death of loved ones. The hope of, in Christ anticipates our reunion with others and with Jesus Christ. Specifically, what the Apostle Paul wants us and the church in Thessalonica to remember is ultimately our resurrection, our resurrection from this life into the next, whether that be after death or before we die, if Jesus were to return, ultimately that is intended to unite us with Jesus Christ. As much as we look forward to being united with loved ones, as much as we look forward to being delivered from suffering and heartache and pain and illness and uh, poverty, as much as all of those things are things we'd like to no longer have be a part of our experience, ultimately the point is for us to be united with Jesus Christ. He says he will come from heaven he, with a trumpet call. He's going to basically say, hey, listen, death, you lose. Death, you lose. He's saying there's a declaration of authority here. He says the archangel makes an announcement. There is a trumpet. And Jesus says, death, you lose. I'll take all of those who are mine. And he raises everybody who's in him from the dead. And it says, in Christ we will rise. After, after that we are alive, we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's right at the end of verse 17. Meet who in the air? Meet the Lord in the air. I want to give you a definition and then I'm going to try and develop this. Well, no, let me give you an illustration first. Okay? A guy... He gets engaged. Beautiful young lady. They're engaged. They fall in love. Uh, you know, may as well be at the county fair on a Ferris wheel. Let's just go full tilt. <laughs> they get engaged, but now he's going to head off to war. And so he heads off to war, and every week he writes back a letter to his uh, fiance, his, his soon to be spouse when he gets home for the war. And he is telling her how much he's looking forward to coming home. He's looking forward to driving his old pickup again. 
He's looking forward to walking his dog again. He simply can't wait to taste apple pie again. And he is looking forward to no longer having to sleep in a foxhole. And he is looking forward to being able to wear something other than a uniform. What is missing from all these letters? Her. When she's opening these letters, now, of course, she's concerned about his suffering and the fact that he's in a war, and she's concerned for his safety. But when you're reading a love letter, you want to hear about how someone loves you. This is what happens when we look so forward to heaven because of everything we won't have here and everything heaven has, but we are very disinterested in the person of heaven, Jesus. The whole point of Jesus returning to the trumpet call with the voice of the archangel is to reunite us with him. It's not so we can get out of a crummy world and get to a better world. It's for us to be united with Jesus. He died on the cross and he rose from the dead so we could have personal, intimate, and close union with him. Not so we could just get away from suffering or so that we could just have some religious warm fuzzies or so that when things got really down we could look forward to heaven one day. Now, that's why I think this whole notion of floating around on clouds, uh, strumming harps, is the most insulting thing ever. First of all, it sounds extraordinarily boring. I'm not a harpist, but if I were, I don't even know that I'd want to do that forever. Heaven is just simply being with Jesus forever. And we say, well, that sounds boring, Greg. Then we don't know Jesus very well. We don't know God very well. Literally, the Bible says we could plumb the depths of God forever and never get to the bottom of Him. He is eternal, unsearchable, and we would spend eternity getting to know Him and loving Him in perfect relationship. If we're not looking forward to being with Jesus, we're not looking forward to the rapture. If we're not looking forward to being with Jesus, we're not looking forward to resurrection. We're certainly not looking forward to biblical resurrection. We're talking about unicorns at that point. The Bible has us being raised from the dead for one purpose and one purpose only, for us to get to Jesus. And when we leave Jesus out of the picture, we've completely missed the reason for us being raised again. As much as we would love to escape this life's hardships, and the Bible doesn't minimize the fact that heaven will be absent all of the hardships we have here. And thank the Lord for that, right? There will be no Legos on the floor of heaven. And if there is, they'll be nice and soft. It will be like stepping on clouds of Lego. <laughs> Heaven, the hope of Christ, is our encouragement. The hope of Christ anticipates our reunion with Jesus. I think there might be a place for us to pause and just think, how much do we really anticipate a reunion with Jesus? You know, I think, I think honestly, it, when the Holy Spirit could really convict us on anything, it's this. We look forward to a lot of things God offers, but sometimes we fail to look forward to God. That's the whole reason He came, so He could know us. All right. The hope in Christ is our encouragement. It's not just simply our escape. Here's what biblical encouragement is. This is a definition if you want to write it down, and the definition comes from the Greg's definition of stuff. Biblical encouragement is this, replacing falsehood with truth, resting in the truth in faith. Biblical encouragement is replacing falsehood with truth and then resting in the truth in faith. Biblical encouragement is not telling somebody something wrong so they'll feel better. That's worldly encouragement. Don't worry, you'll have a unicorn one day. Biblical encouragement replaces falsehood with truth. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. He wants us to confront the lies we tell ourselves in our own lives and the lies that are demonstrated as we live. When we live unhopeful, discouraged lives, we're demonstrating somewhere we are either believing a lie or we don't have the right information. And the Bible, in telling us to encourage each other, biblical encouragement is always somewhat confrontational. We get this notion that biblical encouragement is just somebody who always has the right thing to say to make you feel better. Typically, biblical encouragement is where I confront something where you are either believing a lie or you have the wrong information. Why are you so upset? Why are you so sad? Why are you so discouraged? Uh, well, I, you know, I'm discouraged because 
I don't think Jesus loves me. Okay, that, you're believing a lie. Somehow I need to replace the information you have and encourage you with the truth. I'm not sure if I can really rest on the promises of God that one day I'll be raised from the dead. Well, then we have, I'm, I need to replace the lie. The lie is I'm not sure if God can replace, uh, resurrect my life or I'm not sure if God really wants to. I need to replace that information with the truth, which is God raised Jesus from the dead, and he did that for you specifically. Now the question is, to receive the encouragement, I have to rest in that in faith. Another way of saying it, I have to believe it. In the Bible, what Paul is telling the Thessalonian believers to do is to encourage each other with these words. Give each other permission to proclaim it honestly when we can tell when we're believing a lie. When we're living in sin, we're believing a lie. We're believing that sin is more satisfying than God is. An encouragement would be when somebody can come in and explain the truth through the Word of God, that sin will never replace God. It will never be as satisfying as God. God is more satisfying. You need to rest in that in truth. Can, can the Holy Spirit actually change my heart so that I would desire God more than sin? When I'm discouraged about the future, when I'm discouraged about whether or not I will see my loved ones again, or whether or not when I die, I will go to see the Lord. I need to have the right information and also be confronted when I don't believe. And that's biblical encouragement. Replacing falsehood with truth, resting in the truth in faith. And that's what the Apostle Paul is calling the Thessalonian believers to do. He's saying, trust that if God raised Jesus from the dead, he will raise the, your dead loved ones from the dead, and he will raise you from the dead. The encouragement we experience in those words will be wholly, complete, wholly reliant on whether or not we actually believe them. Encourage each other with these words. So the hope we have in Christ is first, there's two sections here. Uh, the first section, the end of chapter 4, is that the hope we have in Christ is our encouragement. We don't really have any other encouragement that is eternal other than the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross and being raised from the dead. He is our encouragement, and we ought to anticipate our reunion with Christ. I want to point out one last thing before we move uh, ch to chapter 5. Now I'm deciding. Yeah, I will. He starts this by saying, I don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. Of course, we get really excited whenever anybody talks about prophecy because we get to talk about the Middle East or oil or sand or something. I don't know. But then, I mean, he's two verses in, he says, we believe they will be raised again, and then he talks about the gospel of Jesus Christ. His whole basis for hope in the work God is going to do in the future is based on what Jesus did on the cross and being raised from the dead. And we're going to see this again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He's going to do the exact same thing, so I just want to point it out. Okay, so the first section, the hope we have, the hope of Christ is our encouragement in this last little section I want to call it this way, the hope we have in Christ is worth fighting for, is worth fighting for. Now listen to what he says this. He says, now brothers, about times and dates, we need not to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape i got to give props to Paul right there. If, as a guy writing, I would never use pregnancy as an illustration. Paul apparently feels bold enough to write and use pregnancy as an illustration. Verse 4, But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so this day should not surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. Verse 6, So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us put, be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. So the hope of Christ is worth fighting for. And he, he tells them this at the beginning. That 
the day is going to come when Jesus is going to return. He's going to return, and the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then those who are alive at the time, will, they'll be raised again. And basically, listen, I don't need, we, let's not talk about the calendar here. I, I don't need to tell you about the times and dates. Let me put it this way, if I can. He says this, you want to know about times and dates? That's the wrong question. When, when, when we read a passage like this and we say, okay, Jesus is coming back, and the dead in Christ will rise first, that'll be interesting to see. That'll be weird. And then we're going to be raised with him. That'll be even more cool. And then the next question we tend to ask is, when is this going to happen? Right? One time I visited this church. I can't remember what church it was. It wasn't this one. Um, but I went, there was a Sunday school room, and they had a, a wall, an entire wall. And maybe I told you about this before. But it was one of these charts of the end of the world. Anybody ever seen one of these charts? And, and they can be relatively detailed. This one had all kinds of bowls of wrath and trumpets of wrath. and Right? You've seen these before. It says, here's what the end of the world is going to look like. And, you know, I have a problem with the chart, so to speak. I think, I think there's a lot of information on there that's a little bit conjecture, but I don't have a major problem with the chart. The problem is, I think it's this. When we read a passage like this, we tend to ask when, and the Apostle Paul is telling us that's the wrong question. What's the right question? Jesus is coming, and he is going to uh, raise the dead of those who have trusted him, and those who are alive who have trusted him are going to be raised with him as also. What's the right question if you know that's going to happen? Karen got, are you ready? That's the right question. Dude's coming back, taking his friends home. Are you ready? That's why you, I'm going to sound a little bit holier than now, but the, those of you who know me very well at all know I'm not that holy, so hopefully this won't be lost. The, I just wonder what Jesus would think of that chart in that Sunday school room. If he came in, here's this chart of all the what's he's going to happen when he comes back. I think he's going to say, where's the cross? Are you ready? That's the whole point the Apostle Paul wants us to understand. The hope we have in Christ is worth fighting for, and he wants every single person who's ever lived to know Jesus is coming back. This isn't a fairy tale. Are you ready? I, when doesn't really matter at that point. The question is, are you ready? And if not, then you better hope it's not today. I guess that would be the one date question you would ask you. If, I, if I'm not ready for him to come back, Lord, wait at least one more day. Maybe I can get ready by tomorrow. The wrong question is when, the right question is are you ready? And in this passage here, he talks about three different groups of people that I want to pull out so we can uh, kind of discuss them at length. Uh, by length, I mean shortly. Verse 3, he says this, While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. There's one group that is not ready for the return of Christ, and these are people who don't trust Christ, and they don't believe in the Word of God, and they don't believe Jesus offers the way of salvation. Maybe they don't believe in God. These are people who have not yet put their faith in Christ for salvation. And these folks are not ready for the return of Christ, because Jesus is coming back, and he will raise those who have trusted him in the past and have died, and he will raise those who have trusted him and who are not yet dead. And those who aren't ready are those who are saying things will always be as they always have been. 2014 will be a lot like 2013 a year later. Christians have been talking about the return of Christ now for nigh on 2,000 years, and he's not coming. Come on, guys, get the clue. He's not coming. Everything will always be as it always has been. And these folks are not ready for the return of Christ, whether they believe it or not, because we have to remind ourselves God's existence and his plan does not require people to believe in him or it, his plan. He exists whether we believe him or not. And he's returning whether we believe it or not. And folks who aren't ready are those who say there is no Jesus or there was a Jesus. He certainly didn't raise from the dead. And he certainly isn't coming back for their own. And he says, look, for those folks, that day will come quickly. Holy cow, what just happened? He's, oh, we did come back. Oh, well, I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't ready for that. There's another a couple of groups in here. There's another group that's, that's not quite ready uh, yet either. But it says, it says this. Re, if I can remind us, verse 4, it says, But brothers, you are not in darkness, referring back to those people who uh, are not trusting in Christ. 
You are not in darkness, so this day should not surprise you like a thief. How does a thief surprise you? Well, he comes in when he, you're not expecting it, typically. Uh, so what you do is you're going on a trip to Honolulu, so you put on your Facebook page, yay, on the airplane to Hawaii, then every thief in Medford sees you're in Hawaii. So that's when he goes to rob your house, right? When you aren't going to be there, when you least expect it. Uh, thieves don't send a postcard saying, hey, just want to remind you of our appointment next Wednesday at 9 a.m. I'm going to stop by and steal your big screen TV. Uh, if you could have it unplugged and packaged in its box, that would be great. They don't do that. And that's what Jesus, when he returns like a thief, those folks who aren't expecting him, whoa, didn't think he was really going to come back. Thought that was a fairy tale. But there are also those in the church who believe but still aren't ready as well. He says, brothers, you're not in darkness. This day should not surprise you. When Jesus shows up for Christians, we should be, he's here. Excellent. I mean, certainly we don't know when it is, but when he comes, we shouldn't be flabbergasted that he actually showed up. We shouldn't be blown away. Well, he, well, we were hoping he would come back, but we weren't really sure. I just felt like I ought to have, all, you know, have my Jesus basket taken care of just in case he does come back. But when, when Jesus comes back, for those who are ready, we're like, all right, he's here. Finally, let's go home. He says, we don't live in darkness. That day should not surprise you like a thief. You are sons of the light. You are sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. He's, he's saying this. Listen, we live in a world that is disbelieving that Jesus Christ is actually returning. But yet, as Christians, we're sons and daughters of light. We're sons and daughters of the day. The world in disbelieving Christ is is like a world at night waiting for the thief to show up. And he's saying, despite the fact that we live in this world now, we should live knowing that we know the truth. We should live as sons and daughters of the daytime, fully anticipating when Christ, that Christ will return and he will come back for those who are resting in him. And, and in this, this, this group of believers at Thessalonica, he wants us to know there are some who are trusting in the Lord, who are living in the light. They say, we can't wait, we can't wait till Jesus returns. We're, we're looking forward to the culmination of our hope. And there are others who appear not to be living that way. They're living more like the world and, put, and putting their hope in the world. These are, these are sons and daughters of the light, but they're living in the darkness. And, and this is Paul's warning to the believers in Thessalonica. It started... Back in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1, I, I'm going to just read a little bit of it here to let you know where he's going with this. Finally, brothers, this is chapter 4, verse 1. We instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. And then he gets specific. It's God's will that you should be sanctified. That means... Be holy, set apart. That you should avoid sexual immorality. That you, each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. And that in this matter no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you about. For God did not call us to be impure, to, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. He's saying this, there's one group of believers who, or one group of people who are not looking forward to the return of Christ. They frankly don't believe in Christ at all. So they have, they're just simply living their life. And when he shows up, it's going to be a complete surprise. But now he's telling, Christ, telling Christians we have two ways we can understand the return of Christ. We can live as believers in the light, living according to God's ways. It's, it's really a warning passage saying we need to follow the standards of God, knowing that one day he will return. When we live in the light, we live like those who are in the daytime. And his illustration is that nighttime is when we carouse and get drunk and do all kinds of crazy things. Why are we living in the world today as though we're nighttime? As Christians, we say we look forward to the return of Christ in the day, but we, in the world we want to live like it's night. And Paul is saying that is no way to live as a Christian. To live, uh, to, to be satisfied by the world, by the, by the impurities of the world, is to deny the return of Christ and to deny that Christ can even satisfy. It's to say my hope is in Christ when he returns, but my hope is in the world today. 
And Paul says this, no, no, no. If your hope is in Christ when he returns, then your hope is in Christ today. Well, but God doesn't know what I need. Yes, he does, and he provides everything we need. It's just sometimes we don't like what he provides. So this creates great tension in our life. And Paul knows this. He says, you're living in the world which is dark, but I want you to live in the light knowing Christ is returning with our hope in him, walking away from the things of this world, walking away from the sins and satisfactions that this world offers. And this is a great tension for us. Sin is a huge problem in the church today. It's always been a problem in the church. It's a huge problem in the church today. But our hope must be rooted in, in Christ's return. If we're seeking our satisfaction in this world, it demonstrates where our hope is. And Paul wants to call them out of their hope in this world to have their hope in Christ who is returning. If I can put it this way, let me put it this way. We don't get to claim that we're looking forward to the return of Christ if our hope isn't rooted in how we live today. If I say, I can't wait till Jesus to return, then I'm going to say, you don't mind him being with you today when you're going to do whatever it is you're into. Whatever your little pet sin is. And we all have them, so don't get me wrong. Nobody's throwing rocks here. Well, some might. I'm not. If, if we're looking forward to Christ's return, then we're saying, Christ, come in. It, then I'd love for you to return today, right now, in this moment. The tension is that today we fight and battle with the fact that this world offers much to us. I'm going to read Romans 8.24 to you. It's a verse that you're likely very familiar with. Uh, let me, I'll start in verse 22 of Romans 8. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Man, Paul is really hung up on this pregnancy thing. <laughs> the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit groan inwardly as we await eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? And so what Paul is telling us here is, listen, there are things that we hope for, that we're desiring here, that we want here. The, the mistake we make is saying, I'm going to try and satisfy those desires I have of my own here in my way. That always will lead to sin. Paul is saying, I get it. We groan, we struggle, we strain, but hope that you have is no longer hope. He's saying, the fact is we have hope because it's not here yet. When we groan and we struggle and strain against the poles and desires of this world, Paul is calling us to put our hope fully and completely in Christ, and he is completely understanding of how hard this is, how difficult this is to live in the world of darkness, trying to anchor our hope on the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he hasn't come back yet. So I don't want us to, to misunderstand. The Bible is not Pollyannish at all about the strain of sin for the Christian who is not yet resurrected. The world does offer much to us, and the strain is real, and the groan is real. But what we ought to do is take that strain and groan and say, Lord, please, I want you to satisfy me. I don't want to be satisfied by the things of this world. Paul is using the hope of what God is going to do in the future to hopefully call us to a life of holiness now. In fact, Paul would say it this way, our our, our, the hope we have in, in the future we have in Christ is demonstrated by the holiness of our life now. I hope that doesn't sound too strong, because I think it's right. No, it's right. If we don't really believe Jesus is going to be back, we're going to live however we want. If we're convinced he's coming back, we're going to learn by the power of the Holy Spirit to set aside those things that we want more than what he, than the things we want that are here more than what we want of him. First, I have no idea what that meant. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must, must clothe itself in the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. 
Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Verse 58 of 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. One of the things I want to point out to you, every time, every single time the Apostle Paul talks about the return of Christ or the resurrection of the believers, he does it to warn us to stand firm and live holy lives for Christ today. There is a never, there is never a time in the New Testament where we are given information about what is going to happen in the future simply for our curiosity. All prophecy is a warning, calling us to godly lives today, knowing what God is going to do in the future. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 15, he calls it a little bolder than he does in 1 Thessalonians. He basically says this, if the Lord's returning, that should be all you should be about your entire life, and that will not be in vain. We are the light. We are sons and daughters of the light in a dark world, and he calls us to fight for it. Back to 1 Thessalonians 5, just these last two observations, and then hopefully we can apply this. Since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. There's a reason he uses breastplate and helmet here. He doesn't say put on faith and love as a bouquet of flowers and hope of salvation uh, as a, I'll go with puppy dog again, skipping through the meadow with my bouquet of flowers and a puppy dog. No, he says breastplate and helmet. Why? Because we're not home yet. We're in the world of darkness. We're, we're, in, the, we're, we're in a place where there, is, there, there are many things that pull us away from the things of God. And he says, your, your defense and your offense and your protection, everything you need as a soldier of Christ is in the work of Christ. Faith and love is a breastplate. Our salvation as a helmet. He is telling us we're going to have to fight to maintain our hope in Christ. If we're going to have our, our encouragement be in the hope of Christ, and if we're going to fight for the hope in Christ, we need to understand it is a fight. And we are in the enemy's territory. And this is going to be tough. And there are things in this world that are going to pull us away from our hope in Christ. There are things in this world that will uh, provide a more immediate return of satisfaction than Christ. And he's saying it's going to be a fight. If you think you can live a holy life in Christ without any problems, you're fooling yourself. He's saying put on your armor and get ready to do battle. I, uh, the, uh, one of the observations I make, this is simply my opinion, so I, I could be wrong, but I'm, like I've said, I've never been wrong before, so why start now? If your Christian life is really, really easy, uh, that may be a time to sit down and pray. Lord, what am I missing here? Because you never get shot at by the enemy when you're sitting at home not doing anything. But as soon as you cross the enemy lines and start taking enemy territory, all of a sudden the guns start going off. And you need to dig a foxhole. And then you realize a foxhole is really lonely if you don't have anybody with you. And this is what the Apostle Paul is describing here. Two brothers, two sisters in a foxhole holding on with everything they have with their, to their faith their hope and love, and it's all completely based on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's a fight, and it's worth fighting for. And look what Paul does here at the end, again, at the end of this passage, discussing the future, but here's where you're rooted in. God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through Jesus Christ. Verse 10, he died for us so that we, whether we are awake or asleep, we may be alive with him. Again, just like he did in the previous section, he's talking about the future when, when Christ will return, but it's rooted and it's anchored on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We only have a hope in the future because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And he tells us to encourage one another and strengthen each other with these words. Verse 11, and therefore encourage one another and build each other up. So he takes it to the next level. Remember, at the end of, of chapter 4, he said, encourage each other with these words. Give each other the right information and encourage each other to, be a faith, to have faith in what, what, what the truth is. Now he says encourage and build each other up. 
So now he not only wants us to teach each other the truth and call each other to faith in the truth, he wants us to build each other up, coach each other in the truth. Uh, this would be like your drill instructor or your football coach. Now this goes beyond just, no, you, come on, buddy. Time to man up here. Time to get this done. We need to put into practice what we believe. He wants to encourage, exhort, put each other in situations where we have to rely on God and rely on one another. One last illustration uh, by way of hopefully helping you understand where my mind is on this. And if you don't know where my mind is on this, me either. So that makes two of us. So no. There's a, a dad, he tells his kids he's going to work. He says, listen, after work I'm coming home. I want your rooms clean. Right? Anybody ever had this experience before? Yes, once or twice. I'll be home after work, have your room clean. Very straightforward, very easy to understand. There's one group of children, he's got a ton of kids, whole house full. There's one group of children who say out loud, vehemently, we do not believe in dad. There is no dad. We'll clean our room if it serves our purposes. Or we won't clean our room if that serves our purposes. We believe there is no dad. There's another group of kids, now they believe in this idea of dad, but they spend all of their time trying to figure out when dad's off work. Okay, now we think he works day shifts, but it may be he's on swing this week. And so he may be coming back in the morning, or maybe he's on a business trip. Maybe he has a two week business trip, and he's not coming back for a couple of weeks. Whether, what we ought to do is we should sit down and figure out all the ways in which dad used to go to work so that somehow, maybe, based on what we see outside the window, we can determine when dad is coming home from work. There's another group of kids who do that. Good kids, nothing wrong with that, but they just spend all their time trying to figure out when dad is off of work. And then there's another group of kids, what do they do? They clean their room. Because then, frankly, neither one matters. The room is clean. When dad comes home, and he is coming home, he is going to find the room clean. We need to be informed. We need to understand Jesus Christ is returning, Christians. There is hope. And yes, it's been 2,000 years. And I frankly think there's a lot of believers today who have given up hope that Jesus will return in our lifetime. He very may will. I certainly hope he does. I was trying to preach long enough he would return during this message. <laughs> he will return. We need to replace the falsehood that says it's been too long. We don't think it's happening. I just need to live my life and gut my way through it and see what happens in the end. We need to live. Our hope is rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ and counting on the fact he is going to return and we are going to be reunited with him. But that call is not for us just simply to feel better. It's for us to clean our room. It's for us to live lives that would glorify the Father when he returns. Not in our own strength, but in the strength of the Holy Spirit. We ought to be about telling people about the work Jesus Christ has done in our life. We ought to be about living a holy life, whatever it takes to root the sin out of our life. We ought to be about learning as much about the Father as we can in His Word in this place as we can today. We ought to be about submitting ourselves to the power of God through prayer. These are the things, not simply that we do to curry favor with God, but because we love the God who is returning. And this ought to replace the falsehood that says this world offers more to us than a relationship in Christ. The other group that might be here today and likely is here today is those who have never put their hope in Christ. And I'm saying dad is returning whether you believe it or not. And, and Paul is calling us to understand the time to place our faith in Christ is before his return, not after. After he returns, everybody will believe. It's just the outcome will be very different. There will not be one who denies the existence of Jesus Christ upon his return. But we are called in the scripture to put our faith in him before his return that our names might be found in the book of life. Trust Jesus, live in the light. So there's a couple of encouragements. Let's live in the hope that is the Lord. That means live a hope that would bring glory to the Father when he returns. And stop looking at the calendar so much. He's coming back. He's coming back. Now, if you have a chart of the end times on your wall in your basement, that's fine. Don't tear it down. Just make sure there's a really big cross somewhere in it, okay? And I'll be okay with it. Let's be informed. Let's have hope. 
Let's replace falsehood with truth and trust in the God who saved us and live our lives as sons and daughters of the light, trusting that he will return and restore our hope to him. Let's take a moment. Let's stand. And I want to give you a moment to pray, as I always do. I want you to uh, seek the Lord with what his word has uh, taught us. I might encourage you this way. Uh, If you're a Christian and uh, you know that Jesus is returning, you're probably like me. Well, I hope he returns just, I hope he returns um, not when I'm sinning, right? Anybody else ever thought that and just me? Okay, now it's weird. I I hope he comes back just, I hope not when I'm sinning. Well, he's going to come back when he comes back. And now might be the time to say, Lord, let me live in my, the hope that is in you, not just to make me feel better, but biblical hope. You know what? Biblical hope is because I want to live a righteous and holy life for Christ. That means the hope that Christ is returning also is a hope that challenges me to live a holy life. So maybe you can come to the Lord with your sin. Lord, let me live a holy life for you. When you return, may I be found with my hand to the plow, working on kingdom things. And if you're one here today and have never put your faith in Christ, I would encourage you, now is the time to do it. The urgency has never been greater. If Paul was urgent 2,000 years ago, how would he be today? The urgency has never been greater. If I can put it this way, we are nearer now than we've ever been. Do not delay. Trust Christ for forgiveness of sins. He forgives all who call on the name of the Lord. Let's take a moment, pray quietly to yourself, whatever God puts on your heart, to give to him in worship. Let's pray.